we prepare students to become tomorrow's leaders in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors of society. We also seek to provide them with the passion and the skills and the knowledge to make a positive difference for people and their communities. And tonight, uh, we have the distinct pleasure of introducing a leader whose career in government is characterized by his passion and his skill in making a positive difference, the Speaker of the State Assembly, uh, John Paris. He's, John is a native of uh, a native Angelino, uh, having grown up in El Sereno and Highland Park. He was elected in 2008 to represent the 46th Assembly District, which encompasses an, a really interesting mix of people from Maywood to Vernon, Huntington Park, Boyle Heights, unincorporated East Los Angeles, downtown LA, and parts of South Los Angeles as well. And in 2010, he was elected Speaker of the California State Assembly, its highest ranking officer. As Speaker, he is focused on solving California's ongoing budget crisis, uh, on promoting policies that create high paying quality jobs in California, and on implementing vital reforms, needed reforms, in California state governance. Prior to his election to the State Assembly, John was active in the labor movement where he spent over 15 years working to create jobs, expand health care, and protect workers' rights. In addition, John serves as an elected member of the National Democratic Committee. He also previously served as a board member for the California League of Conservation Voters and the LA Economic Development Cor Corporation among uh, several other uh, distinguished appointments, too many to list. As the first openly gay person to be elected to the position of State Assembly Speaker in the country, John has been a longtime advocate on behalf of the LGBT community. He has been especially active in the fight against HIV AIDS, taking up leadership roles with AIDS Project Los Angeles and the Latino Coalition Against AIDS. And uh, this got a lot of national recognition. So in recognition of this, he was appointed by both, to consider this in today's partisan environment, both President Bill Clinton and President George W. Bush to serve on the President's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, it's just a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to have you be able to speak with us today. Uh, I wanted to, to get your, your thoughts on a number of different things. Um, leadership, working in Sacramento, comparing Sacramento with sort of being local. Um, maybe you have some reflections on the stuff happening in Washington. Uh, that might be helpful. Um, but what I thought would be um, a good place to start, the New York Times yesterday, or last week, uh, gave an, uh, printed, printed an article where they talked about California as being a model for how a state should be run. And um, not something they would have written a few years ago. Uh, not one year ago, I think. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so how has it been? I mean, has it, you, you've seen um, your, um, your leadership evolved from being uh, in a non-supermajority to a supermajority. Has that changed how things work? Or? That's not one of the most significant elements of what's changed. Uh, it was actually probably the least consequential thing. So the most? I think the most consequential is some of the structural changes we've made to the way that we've governed ourselves. One of the problems with California, and really up until a couple of years ago, the question that was repeatedly asked and the question that would uh, be the title of policy forums was, is California governable? And there was this notion that we weren't because of our size, because of our diversity, because of a variety of factors. They were consistently wrong. We were in fact governable, but we had structural impediments. In my opinion, one of the greatest structural impediments that we had as a state was the fact that we were one of only three states in the country that required a supermajority to pass a budget. It was California, Arkansas, and Rhode Island. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I don't think we're very much like Arkansas or Rhode Island. And I, mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, the speakers of Arkansas and Rhode Island will both be with me here in Los Angeles tomorrow. 
uh, along with 40 <laughs> other speakers from around the country. But we're very different in our scale and our impact on the world. And both Arkansas and Rhode Island had single party rule that exceeded their supermajority requirement. So in practical terms, California was the only state that required a bipartisan supermajority to enact a, govern, uh, a budget. And so what you saw was a pattern of budget negotiations year after year where a minority party could engage in extraction and leveraging as opposed to debate on fiscal issues. And we saw it time and time again. When I ran for the assembly in 2008, one of the things I said I wanted to deal with was returning California to a simple majority. In 2010, the voters approved going to a simple majority. And since that point, we've passed three on time balanced budgets in a row, which is the first time in 30 years that the state has had that. Now, what's been the result? The result has been balanced budgets, to be sure. The result has also been consistent upgrading of our creditworthiness. And uh, that has been one of the most meaningful things. Prior to that, you'd consistently have very late budgets. And you would not have the appropriate focus on fiscal considerations, which then meant when you were having policy discussions, uh, again, people would stray from the items before them. So I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I wanted to definitely get into this because you know, what we're seeing in Washington sounds like California in, in the bad years. 2010, yeah. right? And 2008. Uh, <laughs> before you got there, I understand. Uh, no, no, because really by, two, by 2010, we were changing. Starting things. to make those changes. Um, do you, looking back on those years in the, in, in the assembly when we were in the bad years, do you have perspectives on what could happen in Washington to break log jams and, and you know, are there straightforward things or are we looking at sort of heroic type of, of tasks? They're pretty straightforward. Um, look, part of this is a question of leadership and is a question of what kind of culture uh, legislative leaders and the executive set. Uh, so you could look at a variety of examples in past years here in California and look at how Senate uh, President Pro Tems or speakers acted in different situations. You could look at how governors acted. You can look at the national level and look at how Senate majority and minority leaders acted and how speakers and the president acted. And what I think you'll find is that right now uh, part of the problem is whether or not legislative leaders in Washington, D.C are empowered to take the actions that are an expression of both what they think the national priorities ought to be and what the collective wisdom of their conferences are. So what you saw, for example, with Ted Cruz's first attempt at pretending to have a filibuster. That was the 21 hours. Yeah, but it was a pretend filibuster. It wasn't a filibuster. Because in a filibuster, you literally try to withhold a vote. He just spoke for 21 hours until the scheduled vote. Uh, it was theatrical, it wasn't actually a procedural uh, action. And there is an appropriate role for filibusters and we have a long tradition of using them in our government, but they're supposed to be used for, for, for things, things that, that, that are of appropriate consequence that nothing but that extraordinary action uh, would respond to. Uh, and Mitch McConnell's, I think, very good control over his conference in the Senate not in dictating to them what they should do, but representing their collective interests in his negotiations. And so when you look at uh, the ultimate agreement between McConnell and Harry Reid, or whether you look at some of the preliminary discussions, I think those operated as we would hope they would. In the House, by contrast, I think Speaker Boehner still struggles with a very divided conference and divided sets of loyalties and questions about how to uh, leverage the collective interests of that conference to act in the public in public's interest. And uh, hopefully as we get ready for the next set of discussions around the debt ceiling, there'll be some adjustments to the way in which he manages that. So I, I, I say all the time, I think Speaker Boehner has one of the worst jobs you could imagine in Washington because that caucus is 
not really manageable. And you didn't. But, but that's not true. Again, people said we were ungovernable. People said that the Democratic caucus here was unmanageable. It's not a question of whether it's manageable or not. It's a question of what systems you put in place to actually manage it. So now, so let's turn back to California. So what did you do to, to manage the unmanageable? So what, what sorts of things did you put in place to, to keep things orderly and moving? Well, two things. Look, your job as a legislator is to, yes, come informed by all of your experiences before you got there, but more importantly, to act as a fiduciary for the state and to really act in the people's interest. And it means that you have to be prepared to make decisions that you don't want to make if they're what's essential at the moment in time. So we had had a pattern of people kicking the can down the road uh, with respect to fiscal problems in the past. When I got sworn in, I was elected in November of 2008. I got sworn in December 1st, 2008. Within two weeks, I was back in a 42-hour session. My first session on the floor of the assembly was 42 hours, not stop Uninterrupted. Uninterrupted. Twice the Ted Cruz filibuster. But we were actually doing something. Uh, and what we were trying to do was deal with, at that point, a deficit of $60 billion out of a $110 billion budget. That's big. Yeah. And it took us some time uh, to deal with that. And roughly 40 billion of it was structural, meaning that it was a deficit that would play out time and time again. And in that first year, we came twice and maybe three times within a day or two of absolute insolvency. So you see what's happened in San Bernardino, you see what's happened in Stockton, you know what is possible. Mm -hmm. But for an economy as large as Californians, and at that point we were about the 11th largest economy in the world, to come within days of insolvency would have huge ripples across the country and quite frankly uh, across the globe. And there were those who were comparing California at that point to Greece in its period of absolute meltdown. And it required us to make devastating cuts that the majority party didn't want to do but knew that we needed to. And for us, we had to decide what the more responsible action was. Was it to make cuts you didn't want to make? Was it to pretend like you didn't have to make them and result in insolvency and effectuate even deeper cuts than your actions would have, would have caused? So we went through that. We did soul searching collectively. We talked about what our priorities should be. And we figured out a way to get through that worst period of the crisis. Uh, within a year's time, I got elected speaker um, and was thrown into immediate budget negotiations with then Senator Schwarzenegger. And at that point, we were dealing with a uh, deficit, roughly about $40 billion. Uh -huh. And the governor's approach was one that erred on the side of making every possible cut. And I thought it was a devastating approach to budgeting. And so I looked at my experience in labor uh, to figure out another alternative. And so instead of just arguing over the construct of the governor's budget, I crafted an alternative budget that we called the California Jobs Budget. And the whole notion was that you had to look at multiple metrics. One was what you did to cut the cost of government for the year. The other was looking at what the out-year impact was. So certain cuts would save you money in a budget year, but increase your cost, cost in the out years. So for example, one of the proposals was to cut back on in-home supportive services, which would have just resulted in people moving into institutions. And, nursing homes and, and the institutions would cost us three times as much the next year than what they saved us in the budget year. That didn't make sense. The other was to look at what the impacts were on jobs. Most economists said that his budget would have cost us between 360,000 and 430,000 jobs. When the bottom is falling out of the economy, in an economy that is two-thirds consumer-driven, it was my point of view that the worst thing you could do is move more people into unemployment. And so we used all of these metrics to push back. It took us 100 days past due to get the budget ultimately resolved that year, but we did it. And in the process, if you use the 430,000 number, we saved 400,000 jobs. 
and we found some smart investments we could make in job growth. So for example, we uh, passed a manufacturing tax credit for green products because we knew that was an area of the economy we can stimulate quickly. And we saw that pay off so that, so that you minimalized the out year hit, minimalized moving people to unemployment, and maximized whatever small targeted approaches you could have to economic stimulus in the immediate term. That laid the foundation for then getting the voters to approve moving to a simple majority and then that becomes how we've gotten to where we are today. So that seems like a pretty tall order for um, a new speaker who's been in Sacramento for about a year and a half, two years at that point. A year and a half at that point. Uh, how did those conversations with Governor Schwarzenegger go? I mean, did you have a personal relationship with him? Like, how did you build trust to, to get him to hear what you were saying? And oh, we never built trust to hear what, he, what I was saying. Uh, it was, look, it was not giving in to his approach when you thought it was wrong. And he just signed it out anyway? I mean, so, so we, we've just... Somebody blinks at a certain point. <laughs> Draw your own conclusion. Fair enough. The conclusion is drawn. Um, I want to talk about your relationship with, with Governor Brown. Like, how does... Well, we just heard how your relationship with Governor Schwarzenegger went. Um, how is it with, with him? He's notoriously unpredictable. So He is not unpredictable. He is hard to define, and if you don't spend enough time with him, he, he appears Seems. unpredictable. Uh, he's actually very easy to work with. He's incredibly engaged. He's incredibly analytical and intelligent. What he isn't is a linear thinker. And so if you approach him with a linear debate, you get nowhere. And if you're willing to have a broad range conversation where anything and everything can come up in figuring out how to get to the solution and you know where you need to go, you can get there together. So there's a, a, a lot of intellectual engagement um, actually sounds like a university type setting. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but not necessarily Socratic. Maybe I can sit in on one of these conversations. We can have, have a good time. Uh, so, so in both, you have to operate both with Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown. You have to operate in multiple languages. Understood. Um, now, what do you do? Do you do special things with your caucus and the Republican caucus uh, in in the assembly? Do you? have regular meetings, mm -hmm. how, how do you manage the, the assembly? So this is nothing new, uh, but every, so the general schedule for a week is members arrive sometimes Sunday night or Monday morning. And at noon on Monday we go into session to deal with whatever items need to come before the house as a whole. Monday afternoon there are a few committees, Tuesday and Wednesday there are a lot of committees, but on Tuesdays at noon, there are four lunches that are held in the Capitol. There is a Democratic and a Republican caucus lunch in each house. And that happens without fail. And so 20 feet away from each other, we're in two different rooms uh, talking within a partisan room in our chambers. And that's the place where people uh, brainstorm ideas on problems that aren't specifically addressed necessarily in a given bill. And that's quite frankly not unlike um, a locker room conversation at halftime in a football game. And those end up being some of the most important conversations. Uh, but that's just part of it. The added complexity is with term limits you've had so much turnover. And so, for example, this year, uh, I started the year with 38 first-term members out of a house of 80. Well, I got to a supermajority of 55, ha more than half. Are new. 28 were brand new. I've added, uh, since then, two. I'll add another two before February. Uh, so, huge infusion of new folks. And so that, what that meant is we had to 
take a different approach this year to how we train new members and spend a lot more one-on-one -on -one time and small group time. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time doing one-on-one -on -one and small group meetings with new members regardless of party. Some of them are small group meetings that are party specific, so I'll get three or four freshman Republicans and have lunch with them, or five or six freshman Democrats and have dinner with them, and some of them are mixed party groups, and you have to do both. So I was wondering about um, the term limit issue because you know, I'm not a big fan of them. I'll just say that right, right up front. Um, what's your take on it? I mean, we've just... It is the single most negatively impactful governing decision we've made for ourselves. And is there any hope of... I mean, so we, we've changed it a bit. Yeah, but let, let, let's go back to what it did and why it did it. The real motivation was to get rid of a speaker that couldn't get defeated at the ballot box, and that was Willie Brown. And so it succeeded in doing that. But in the process, it was packaged up with so many other things. So it said you can only serve in the Assembly for six years, you can only serve in the Senate for eight years. It cut the budget of each chamber by half, so that you had to downsize the staff in the Capitol. It took away pensions from legislators, so you know, when we talk about pension reform, remember mine is zero. Um, it took away pensions. And what it did is it shifted power in three ways. One, it shifted power away from people in office to lobbyists. Because as half of the legislative staff left, most of them went to lobbying firms or to advocacy groups. The institutional memory went with them. So the institutional memory significantly it's went not, not outside like of the Capitol. People left staffing had to double up on policy areas that they had to be experts on, which means that they could dig down less far than they had in the past. And you have such a high turnover of legislators with six years in the Assembly that you didn't have legislators who necessarily built deep expertise in a given policy area. So that's the shift to power outside of the building. Within the building, it shifted power so that there was a greater concentration of power in the Senate than in the Assembly. Why? Because most often people got elected to the Senate after having served in the Assembly, so you had a greater degree of experience there than in the Assembly. And the third thing is because you had that term limit, it decreased the amount of accountability work that legislative committees could do, and as a result it shifted more power to the executive branch. And so those are three consequential shifts of power. The reform that came in the last election cycle was to say new folks getting elected could serve 12 years in either house or any, any combination. Which means that it shifts a little power back from the executive to the legislature, little power back from the Senate to the assembly, and actually in the next couple of years, significantly more power in the assembly than the Senate. It also changes the perspective in some of these long-term questions. As we go in and deal with budget issues, for example, the 70-some percent, or 50-plus well, percent of my members in the Assembly will be able to be there for the next decade. Something like 72 percent of the Senate will see their last election next year. And so it changes your calculus as you're evaluating long-term decisions. So I want to actually now turn to policy areas and decisions. I want to start with the undone. So what is the biggest policy area that you feel like we need to focus on um, in order to move, to move the state in a better direction? You don't direction? want to give us any credit for what was done? I'm going to get there. <laughs> We've had a nice, happy conversation so far. I've got to throw a little cloud in this. Well, look, first of all, nothing is ever done. So, you know, I will agree with that. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. When I, um, I'll tell a little story. So when I was uh, being confirmed for my position in the Obama administration, uh, my hearings, uh, Senator Mike Johans, who was the Secretary of Agriculture at the time, uh, said um, something that stuck in my mind to this day, and it was the best thing that I heard in my whole run-up which was when you get into office, there'll be a lot of problems. 
and when you leave office, there will be a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So set your expectations and understand that you know, incremental is, is good um, and don't set your expectations so ambitiously that you run yourself in the ground and drive yourself crazy. Um, so I, I actually agree with, with the sentiment. Um, I do, if you look at the legislative action of the last, uh, the last two years, uh, last year, uh, Governor Brown vetoed a bunch of things. Um, is there one thing that you really wish that he hadn't? Oh, there are many. Um, look, let's just start with my bills that he vetoed. I think he shouldn't have vetoed any of them. Um, <laughs> the one that I still cannot understand for the life of me why he vetoed was my bill to create a strategic document for the Governor's Office of Business Development. Prior to my time in office, there was no statewide coordinating entity uh, that worked on economic development for the state. So all of our economic development decisions in California were really localized. So you had cities, in some places counties, and in some places COGS, councils of governments, creating economic development plans, but there was no unified statewide approach. And as a result, what you saw too often was cities competing with each other. And because of certain tax structures, you saw them disproportionately competing for retail sales tax generators and for hotels because of transient occupancy tax. What you didn't have them competing for was high net worth jobs. There was no incentive system. And so I, in 2010, uh, wrote a bill to create the Governor's Office of Business Development as an overall coordinating body. Got vetoed that year. Next year I wrote it again, new governor. I took out the offensive language, which was Senate confirmation for the executive officer, got it enacted, and then expanded its duties to not only do economic development work, but to do trade because of the importance of trade uh, in the California economy. And by all measures, it's doing a very good job. But I think it's appropriate on a biennial basis to do some strategic planning so that you can figure out appropriate accountability measures to make sure that you're actually getting some of the outcomes that you want. The governor vetoed that. I don't know why. I still can't understand. I think that was probably the least defensible of the vetoes of, 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 of my legislation. One of the other ones that was controversial, so I understand how it was difficult for him to decide whether to sign it or not, but I think would have been important to sign, was a bill that I had uh, to create a system for medical interpretation. And when you look at how diverse the population of California is and what the problems in the healthcare delivery system are, when you have communications and language barriers, uh, you have people that are getting undertreated because of communications problems, and you have people that are being over-tested because of communications problems. When you can't get the interaction with a patient, and if you're super diligent, you may Just call for three or things, four right? or five tests that wouldn't necessarily be, uh, be important. Uh, to do otherwise. But we've also seen really dire consequences. There was a woman who had tried for multiple years to get pregnant and she was having difficulty. She finally gets pregnant, doesn't know it, uh, is having symptoms, goes to the hospital, talks to the doctor, the doctor informs her that she's pregnant and asks her if she wants to keep the baby. She said yes because she was very excited that she was finally able to get pregnant. He gave her some medicine, she took it, and she came back a short time later sees another doctor, complains about horrible abdominal pains, and he asked her if she was taking any meds, and she showed him, and he says, well, your pains are the abortion that you're inducing from this medicine that you're taking. There was a communication there between she and the doctor on the question of whether or not she wanted to keep the baby. And she ended up medically inducing an abortion yes, she didn't because of that lack of conversation. When you look at the Asiana airline crash that happened in San Francisco a couple of months ago, one of the keys to the ability to have dealt with that volume of critical patients was that when they were triaging, not only were they looking at the acuity of the injury, but they were looking at the language spoken by the crash victim. 
so that they could send them to the right sets of hospitals, which thankfully in San Francisco, there were it's enough diverse. infrastructure for Korean and Chinese language speakers in the hospitals to be able to triage them. Had the accident happened somewhere else, there wouldn't have been the infrastructure, we wouldn't have been able to save as many people as we, as we were able to. So, you know, from my bill perspectives, those are the two uh, that stand out. From a broader perspective, there was an important bill by Assemblywoman Tony Atkins dealing with, uh, from San Diego, dealing with the issues uh, that are still very real after the deconstruction of redevelopment agencies. And it was a broadly popular bill, I think it passed by 77 out of 80 votes in the Assembly and 38 out of 40 votes in the Senate. Uh, very popular with cities, very popular with other folks, and really allowed us to continue to move forward with some of the economic development work that was, that was essential. But that is a governor's prerogative. Uh, we don't agree on everything. We really disagree on those three, and there's, I'm sure, many more. So is there an override coming on that? I was going to ask you about redevelopment, because uh, it has played such an important role in building up communities that, that need it. As I said, vetoes are the prerogative of a governor, and overrides are the prerogative of a legislature. Well, good luck with that. I, I hope that it passes. Um, to talk about some of your priorities for the next, uh, the next session. Look, the most important thing is to continue to move forward on stabilizing uh, the economy and the finances of the state. So I told you about the $60 billion in deficit when I got elected. We have completely eliminated the structural deficit of the state of California in three years. We have built a small $1.2 billion reserve. We are recovering faster than 44 states. Our revenues are coming in faster than all but one state. We're growing jobs faster than any other state. We've regained our position as eighth largest economy in the world. We've increased our bond rating, so much so that between January and May of this year, the cost of financing state government went down by $480 million. Uh, pretty significant. But what we know is part of that solution was short-term taxes that will expire. And so all of the decisions that we made in budgeting this year were predicated on the fact that you had to wean yourself off of those short-term taxes and that your out-year spending had to be supportable by ongoing revenues. And so my biggest priority is making sure that next year, as revenues continue to rise, that we don't confuse one-time and short-term revenues for ongoing revenues. Part of that was the concept that we unveiled this year in our Blueprint for Responsible Budgeting, which is creating a real rainy day fund. California has incredibly volatile tax receipts. Because of its structure. Because of the structure. And we're disproportionately dependent on capital gains taxes and taxes from high net worth individuals. If you look over the last 20 years, they fluctuated anywhere between 3% and 14% of our general revenues. And so in years that we thought the high number would replicate itself year over year, some of our predecessors made bad spending decisions. Long-term commitments. Long-term commitments. And so it is my belief that the most responsible approach is to look at the spikes in revenue and treat them differently. And so the notion that we're working on is any time when those revenues exceed 6.5% of the general fund, again, they've fluctuated between 3% and 14%, any time that they exceed 6.5%, anything above the 6.5% line ought to be put in a rainy day fund. And that you have to build that rainy day fund until it's at least 10% of the value of the general fund obligations. But, but isn't there, don't, don't the propositions prevent you from doing that? Aren't Not at all. Not at all. Second piece, once you've filled the pot, then you can only use them for one-time purposes. Infrastructure, long-term debt payment, so that you decrease the cost of long-term debt that we're carrying, and so that you make investments in long-ignored infrastructure. If we had done that, 
20 years ago, we would have completely erased the impact on the state of the recession at the beginning of the century, and we would have cut in half the impact of the Great Recession on our state budget. And you can do this without any initiatives? No, or... no, no. We can only, uh, we, we would need to go to the ballot. And so the idea is for the legislature to vote on it and put it before the voters next November. Well, that would be an important, uh, important change yeah. to have that buffer. That would be important. I have two other questions. Then I want to move to the audience for, for questions. Uh, the first has to do with leadership. Yeah. And I uh, wanted to uh, get your thoughts on if you had uh, some guiding principles about how to lead or techniques and devices. And then also um, had a question about did, whether you had some mentors or people who you try to emulate in, in executing your leadership. The answer to the second question is no. There's no, no single no. model. Um, and now that I say that, I'm going to walk it back. <laughs> I don't have political mentors in that way. Folks who, you know, you, know you, you take a little from as many places as you can. And I know this is USC. Um, Be careful. And I didn't go to UCLA, so don't take it wrong. <laughs> but John Wooden. Um, when you look at what he did with his players the first day, I try to emulate that. What was the first thing he did? He would teach them how to put on their socks and how to tie their shoes. And that sounds funny, but it wasn't that they didn't know how to put on a pair of socks or tie a pair of shoes, but he had a system that he wanted to impart on them. And he wanted to reinforce the importance of fundamentals. And it's not unlike what the military has done historically with respect to boot camp. It wasn't that you needed to learn how to shine your belt buckle to be a good soldier. It's that you needed to understand the importance of discipline and fundamentals, and that you never lose sight of those two things. And so I try to impart that with my colleagues. And fundamentals are different in a legislative position than they are uh, in a sports team. But the other is this idea of responsibility to each other. And so um, I work very hard to create a level of collegiality amongst uh, my colleagues. And I think we've done a pretty good job of, of succeeding in that. And the last question I had, I haven't asked you about your next campaign, but hopefully we'll get to that, um, is about leading in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, so this series is called Leading from the West. And I wondered um, if you had thoughts on, um, I wonder what your thoughts are on the difference in being from the West and, and how you engage leadership and sure. policy. Look, the reality of life in the West is different. Um, why people came here, different than why people are in other parts of the country. Um, and true, especially of California, but of the West in general, is we tend to be more diverse, and we tend to be uh, less constrained by super traditional approaches. And it lends itself to a degree of innovation that I think you see up and down the West, but particularly here in California. Uh, and so that means that your approach to leading has to be responsive to both that diversity and that innovation. Uh, Remember, I told you that uh, we are recovering faster than 44 states. Amongst the states that are recovering faster than us are Oregon and Washington, hmm. also Western states. Uh, there's something to be said for that innovation. The other reality is, especially in California, but the West in general, we are uniquely positioned in the Pacific Rim. And when you look at future economic growth globally, so much of it is centered around the Pacific Rim. And so how we relate to other Pacific Rim forces is different uh, than it is for my colleagues in the East. Well, sometimes I'm not sure the East even knows that there is a Pacific Rim, yeah. so it's a, it's a very different, different perspective for sure. 
Um, we're going to go to questions from the audience. Um, so raise your hand and we'll take care of that. I would uh, just ask two things. First, that you wait for the mic to come to you. And then second, uh, well, three things. Second, have it actually be a question uh, as opposed to a speech. So uh, just don't you agree at the end of it doesn't count as a question? No, that does not count, no. <laughs> and then the third is um, try to ask a question in a way that you would like a question asked of you. So um, with those, we'll start here. Okay, I think I can meet those three criteria. Uh, Speaker Perez, what do you see as the prospects next year for changes to the California Constitution to remove hurdles facing communities that want to pass infrastructure bonds to improve infrastructure uh, that they find important? Let me, are, are you asking about lowering the vote threshold? Yes. Um, I don't know yet. Um, it depends on how it's structured. Here's, you have to understand, I am not a big fan of the initiative process. I am a believer in representative democracy. Uh, and this is not a position I just came to since I've been in elective office. I, I've been involved in trying to get us to focus more on representative than uh, the initiative process for a long time. The problem with even a fix is that it has to be constructed in such a simple way that you can appeal to enough voters to vote for it, which doesn't necessarily lend itself uh, to the level of specificity that you would want to make good policy. And so on all these kinds of questions, the answer I hate to give but is the most honest is, it literally depends on how it's written and how well it polls. Um, the broad-based question of whether people are willing uh, to make it easier to invest in infrastructure is yes, but it depends on accountability measures. So for example, here in Los Angeles, uh, measure R had enough accountability measures, got passed. Prop BB had a whole accountability system in place for investment in school-based infrastructure, it got passed. Uh, others have not, and it really becomes a craft of how the initiative is written as opposed to what the real policy is. Next question. A speaker, thanks for coming. Um, about a week ago in Time Magazine, there was an essay published that postulated that Los Angeles has the ability to become independent of distant sources of water. And I know that there is a proposal uh, that's now coming before the state to build a large infrastructure pro uh, project. And I I'm just wondering if it's possible that we can start to move to more innovative ways of doing things. I mean, we, we appreciate the North's water very much, but uh, it seems like it would be better if we could do without it. I didn't uh, see the article. Uh, I have nothing that I've seen that makes me believe that in any short-term basis we could be independent from distant sources of water. Uh, we have a huge water problem in the state. Um, for us to be independent, we'd either have to find new water sources here or move to massive levels of desalination. Uh, I don't think the water exists here and we haven't found it. So, you know, take that one off. I haven't seen anybody do desal in a way that is scalable uh, to take us off of our dependence on distant sources of water. And I haven't seen anybody do desal in a way that didn't use so much energy that it would create other huge environmental consequences when you look at uh, the size of Los Angeles. What I'm proud of is if you look over the last 20 years, as our population has grown, our net water use has actually decreased. So I think we are amongst the best in the state and probably in the country at water conservation. And there's still a lot more that we can do. One of the local infrastructure questions that I think we have to ask is whether we should approach future infrastructure investments into a dual piping system so that you can treat to different levels and so that you could actually have gray water infrastructure and drinkable water infrastructure. Because right now we treat all water to a drinkable standard. And so we're spending a lot of resources treating water to a drinkable standard that's never gonna 
be used for human consumption. That would save us a significant amount of money over time. But the rest of the state has to step up with respect to conservation the way we have. Huge parts of the state population still are not metered. Uh, and when you look at agriculture, for example, we don't meter ag. Uh, agriculture is hugely important to the state. But by not metering, we don't have any market-based forces around water consumption and what crops we choose to use. You look at Kobe beef, for example and the importation of high quality beef from other parts of the world. It's made possible because we export our alfalfa. But alfalfa is hugely water intensive. So we end up using a lot of our water resources to export a low cost crop to bring back a high cost commodity. Not necessarily a very smart approach. We don't have enough water infrastructure for savings, uh, for storage. So for example, in Fresno two years ago when we had a good water year, the Friant Dam ran off as excess water something around 1.5 million acre feet. That would have been enough to provide water to the city of Fresno for 10 years. We have antiquated sets of water rights where you have some property owners in the ag parts of the state who don't have access and have to deadhead productive crops and just across the street people are having huge access. And then lastly, we have real problems with water quality in a variety of rural parts of the state and some urban parts of the state. So you talked about the fact that I used to represent Maywood. Maywood has water that isn't regulated by the uh, utilities. It's regulated by the Department of Real Estate and mm -hmm. through a weird fluke in law. And the water that comes out of the pipes there is nothing like anything anybody would want to drink. We've made significant investments to fix that, uh, but, but, but a significant portion of our state's population really doesn't have dependable access to good quality water. So any infrastructure investment that we make has to deal with all of those issues and a real evaluation of environmental mitigations uh, upstream. And so we had a $14 billion bond that is never going to pass. And you've got the governor talking about two tunnels that I don't think happen. And then you've got our Water Parks and Wildlife Committee looking at cobbling together a different approach to a water bond that I think is more in line with what the needs we have as a state. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Depends on how long-winded I am in the answers, I guess. Exactly. I didn't want to say that. but um, <laughs> Make up, the question the simple. I'll be quick. Um, I, I'll try to. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm sorry that your statewide economic development council got vetoed. And um, so how can the legislature attract um, businesses back to California, especially Southern California? Silicon Valley is doing great. And how do we entice the ones to stay? A couple of things. The council itself didn't get vetoed. It's up in place, the go biz. What got vetoed was the idea of the strategic plan. So we think that one of the things that we could do is take the limited resources we have and prioritize them in a different way. Until this past year, we had enterprise zones in the state of California. They were costing us roughly $750 million a year, and they were disproportionately uh, uh, subsidizing low-quality jobs. The biggest beneficiaries were retail operators, retail operators even more than fast food, uh, and some uh, non-location-based uh, low-end manufacturing, food processing. And we weren't doing a whole lot to compete for the high net worth jobs. So what we've done is we've restructured that program. You still have the geographic areas that we would like to have investment in, but we restructure how we use the incentives. So instead of any job getting a benefit, uh, the job would have to pay one and a half times the minimum wage to four times the minimum wage to be able to get the subsidy. Why? Because we shouldn't be subsidizing minimum wage jobs that are going to exist anyway, and we shouldn't need to subsidize jobs that are four times the minimum wage where there are other marketplace forces that would allow us uh, to do that. The other thing we did is we created a minimum of, I believe, $250 million on an annualized basis that would be able to be used by GoBiz to do the kinds of business attraction 
and business retention innovation, interventions that other states have historically done. It'll take a couple of years to test this out and figure out how effective it is, which is again why I wanted to have a strategic planning document so that on a biennial basis you could look at the efficacy and then figure out collectively how to fine tune that. But I actually think we're in a pretty good space in terms of the early years. The data is gonna have to drive how we adjust it in the out years. And even without strategic planning document, there still are ways for us to do the accountability and evaluation work. So um, we, we are quickly running out of time, but I uh, two things I wanted to say. One, this has been great. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and um, there are a whole host of other things I wanted to talk about that we're not going to be able to cover. Identity politics, LGBT issues, uh, the unions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have an advisory board here, and the unions come up all the time as uh, a bottleneck to some policies mm -hmm. and streamlining processes, and so maybe we can have you back to just talk about that for a while. But I, I did feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask about your decision to move on from the assembly. Well, it wasn't a decision that I made. It was a decision that the voters made when they passed term limits in the 90s. <laughs> if so, I could stay on in the assembly, I'd do it in a minute. And so, I love being a legislator. And it, uh, that, that has come through very clearly uh, in the conversation tonight. Um, so why control it? Look, if you look at the focus I've had in office, not the focus I necessarily thought I'd have coming into office, it's really been around stabilizing the economy of the state and the finances of the state. And outside of being able to stay in the legislature, uh, the place where I think I could have the greatest impact in that is the controller's office. You mentioned unions. One of the issues associated with that is pension obligations. I'm a believer in defined benefit pensions but I think they have to be affordable as well as dependable. And so we have a real problem with out-year costs in the two largest pension funds in the country, CalPERS and CalSTRS. We've done some reform that has helped us start to deal with that problem, but there is still huge out-year liability. And as somebody who believes in defined benefit pensions, but, defined, but believes they have to be affordable, they have to be sustainable, uh, I'd like to engage in that work as the controller as well, because the controller sits on the Kelpers and Kelsters uh, boards, and I think that's really important in terms of the long-term economic well-being of the state as well. And there's a question about how we can be more creative about leveraging the institutional investing power of the state of California to create more economic activity within the state. Uh, so that is very appealing to me. Lastly, the controller probably sits on more boards than anybody else. There are 81 boards and commissions where you get to touch a lot of policy areas. You said 31? 81. 81? 81. 81. Uh, and so that's not quite as busy as I am now, uh, but it might be busy enough to keep me interested. That seems plenty busy, and I'm imagining you'll be very interested. Um, the, the pension issue is huge. So I was in Chicago not long ago, and um, it is bringing down state governments and city governments all over the country, these long-term obligations that we But two things. One is what the long-term obligation is, and two is a change in the calculus of what the long-term obligation is, which has magnified the problem. Uh, and third is the fact that we're still coming back from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and so the, the net worth of our holdings has gone down. So it's part of the problem will self-correct as the market adjusts. Most of the problem will not, and that takes creative intervention. So we're on a college campus, and um, you have a, a world of experience. You've seen a lot of things. Um, what advice would you give to a young uh, student uh, thinking about going into the policy space? We're a public policy school. We have a number of students out here. What would you tell them to do in terms of approaching uh, building a career in the policy space? I'm glad you said policy space as opposed to politics because I think too many people enter politics for the wrong reason. Uh, look, you have to find an issue that you're passionate about and then really dig deep. In the process, you have to build skills that are applicable in other areas as well because the chances of finding a key policy area, uh, policy job, just in the policy area that you're super passionate about isn't you know, highly likely. Uh, and it, but, but people who truly love 
policy discussions. They have lots of ways that they can engage, and so I'm a fan of them coming into a legislative body and bringing that, that passion and that expertise, or they can go to an advocacy group. I think it's more important to come into the legislature uh, engaging in some of our policy work. And what you'll find, I think, much as you find in an academic setting, is that you think that you're passionate about one thing. And as you get exposed to these other areas, you find a passion that you never knew you had before. Well, I'm very glad you said that. The, the last big event we had, Nate Silver was here on campus. And he says he actively advises people not to get involved in the legislative process because it's messy and it's difficult. And it well, so look, this is the difference between being a prognosticator and, a, uh, <laughs> and an observer versus somebody who's actually in there. And I have tremendous respect for Nate Silver, I think. He is absolutely at the top of his game. Uh, but you don't change the world just by analyzing it. You gotta roll up your sleeves and engage. And that is a good word to end with today. Uh, Speaker Perez, it's been fantastic to talk with you. Thank you for coming Thank to campus. Thank you. It's been great to have you. Thank you.